weekend of unity I felt um, all the way around there was uh, the reverb there's quite a few of you who went there and um, there was some of us that went over to uh, TD Garden in Boston where they had three uh, worship groups um, worshiping and and it was that was great too there's 13,000 people all wow. just ministering and in, in in worship and you know it just made me understand that God is really looking beyond our individual churches Mine. that's true our vision shouldn't be just FFC or NBCC or NECC um, God really wants to bring all together gather people together now there's lots of voices of unity in the world and you know some of them are are, are just uh, because people want to go their own direction and do this and do that we have you know people that want to um, uh, see globalism in the world we want people want to see nationalism in the world we want we see churches that want to have get together and just worship any God that they choose and just just come together we have uh, you know churches that that unite around various things but one thing that really impressed me about the um, worship night that we had was that the first thing the guy did on the first group the elevation worship was he, he held up the Bible and he said this is what we want to unify around and that was really uh, you know heartening to me because we can go so far astray and in, in trying to find unity that we can't really discover what God wants for the church how he's purifying the bride and when what is happening unless we really unify around around Scripture and the problem is that, as Pastor Mario was stating is that the enemy really is at work too we're, we're facing Amen. a battle Amen. that um, you know we have to be ready for and uh, I heard a, a story that it's kind of funny and I, I wanted to relate it because um, there's a captain was on the deck of a warship and uh, the, an aide comes running up to him and he says captain captain we just spotted five enemy warships on the horizon and so the, the captain says um, bring me my red coat and prepare for battle and so uh, so the raid comes running back as a red coat he says sir why the why the red coat he says well if I get shot and and I start to bleed I don't want the crew to just panic and not and not fight and so um, the aide goes back and then next thing you know he comes running and he says captain captain there's over 50 enemy warships on the horizon so the captain says bring me my brown pants and prepare for battle <laughs> you know sometimes I think we're not only gonna have to wear brown pants we may have to get brown shoes too <laughs> but you know wow, that's true. Think of it. we're in a battle and we really haven't seen anything right right wow. really not here not in this country really I mean there are issues that we all face individually but collectively we haven't really seen a battle when following Christ means not only losing our possessions but maybe our life and our family then we can say we're in the middle of a battle and you know to think of that is is kind of frightening but at the same time we also will find out what Christian unity means. That's right. Amen? Amen. We'll also find out what unites and binds us together. And it's been on my heart for a long time because I feel like that, that God has kind of given me almost a burden for the, the body of Christ in a way that, you know, I sense kind of His... Uh, his heart let's put it that way just his heart for the disjointedness of of the body of Christ you know when um, when the Apostle Paul was Saul and when he was knocked off his horse after persecuting the church so much and going to persecute it against the Lord said to him Saul why are you persecuting me you think that the head doesn't feel what the body is going through and um, you know that's that's the thing that I think we all have to get a heart for we, we have to get a heart for what Christ is going through and how he wants and desires us to be a purified bride 
in um, in the chapter that I really love in Ephesians it says husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that's all of us that he might sanctify her that's all of us having cleansed her that's all of us by the washing of water with the word that's all of us so that he might present the church to himself in splendor that's all of us without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish that's all of us right. all of us and you know we had um, Pastor Wes at our church last week Amen. and he, uh, he, he gave a message about surrender so he, uh, he gave three levels of surrender that we, can, we all should go through as we're following Christ. And he said, first of all, is to pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Amen. That's one level. The next one is dying to yourself. Because if you try to gain your life, you're going to lose it. That's right. And then the third thing he said was to renew the mind, to put off the old and put on the new. And that's the hardest one really to do because it, it involves our thought process it involves our daily life all the time it's kind of like we're, we're already programmed to do one thing and and it seems like god is programming us to do another thing and we we often choose what to think about and he says that you know think on these things don't think on those things and sometimes it's it's so difficult for us to get out of the pattern because there's a momentum that goes with that pattern once you get started on it, it's like we, we talked about uh, the negative swirl type of thing, where you know you start going down the drain that way, or you rise up that way. And once you, you begin on that, that, you find that a momentum will carry you to some degree. That's right. Once you start. The problem is getting off of where we are and beginning, and that's, that's the thing that, that the Holy Spirit needs to help us to do. Because we really need to to find that level of surrender and be able to do it as a church now that's some um, kind of what I talked with him about at the end of his um, sermon and I went and, I, and, and he, we were both saying if the whole church would just do that then there would be revival if if all of us would do those three levels and there would be complete revival and I had to agree and I also added though I said to him but if God is to make us an army everyone has to submit one to another right. into the leadership of the church there's no way around it we just have to do that that's and he said to me you know that's a whole another level of surrender because we're trying to, to surrender not only to God, but he's put us in a situation where we have to submit one to another. And that's difficult. That takes a renewing of the mind in that area, not just uh, with God, but in, in the area of the rest of the church and the body of Christ. And, you know, I think that we need to get the attitude that if we are have a certain attitude towards the body of Christ we're having that certain attitude towards the Lord Jesus and that is I think going to be for for us the, the most difficult thing to be able to accomplish because we're so widespread everything is is all over the world all over the country even in the city there must be how many churches that believe in in Jesus and so I just wonder how we're going to be able to do it without extreme persecution. I really do. I, I'm not sure that it can even be accomplished sometimes. I'm, I'm like, Lord, how are you going to bring us together? How, what are you going to unite us around? We, we all have you know, our, our doctrinal stances and this and that thing that we do that is, is unique with all of us. And some people have a different flavor than other people. But at the same time we're all a church we're all claimed to be a church of Christ the body of Christ and he's bringing that body and purifying it together there's going to be a gathering together gathering together to meet him and that's going to be a tremendous thing because we're all going to be cleansed 
And he says we're going to be cleansed by the washing of the water with the word. That's how it's going to happen. Somehow that's going to have to happen. And you know, it's, it's not going to be perfect. As we, as we come towards that goal, it's not going to be perfect because we have to unite around the things that are important. We have to unite around the things that are the mission, the things that he's called us to do that we have no, um, n no dispute about. Amen. Amen. We, are, we have a mission that he's called the church to do, and we have something greater than ourselves, greater than our own philosophy, than our own um, way that we see all of Scripture. But at the same time, we have to have really scriptural, and Wes would probably call it rally points, scriptural rally points that we all see that are common, that we can, we can all attach to and say, yes, this is the attitude and this is the principle that I want to follow in this scripture that will lead to the others or at least make the others, put the others in a different light so we can all work together. And... I really have a burden to see that happen, and, and, and I know that um, we, we are attempting to do something along those lines with our, with our churches, and it's amazing, it's amazing how many things we can run into, how many things that we can run into, how many things the devil will, will do to us and, and try to get us get us off track and try to keep us focused on something else on our families and our situation we we've had things happen to us and and I know Pastor Mario and I know almost everybody that's involved in 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 the leadership um, group and, and even in the in the congregations have had that attack hit us in places that we didn't expect Amen. and uh, the thing is, is that we have to get to the place where those things are recognized as something that's coming from the enemy. We have to unite as a, as a body. We have to unite behind the, the body that we have and, the, and the, the ultimate body of Christ as a whole and really start to picture ourselves as a part of a, the big picture. You know, um, I remember way back in, when I had driver training that uh, the first, the, the only thing I really remember about it is, is the <laughs> was uh, there was a, the driver's manual. The driver's manual, the first page, it had like a, a windshield and it said, get the big picture. You know, and and I really wasn't didn't really consider that. I didn't really, you know, pay attention to it. But I remember the first, uh, the first car that my father let me drive was this huge station wagon. We, we called it like a, a beach wagon. And, you know, it was like a boat, a big boat. And so um, I'm driving that thing. I'm taking some kids to some kind of, a, I think it was a church <laughs> thing. But when I, when it was, for one thing, it was kind of dark, you know, out and I hadn't really driven when it was dark, but but I was so focused on the line at the side of the road that when I turned the corner, I went right over the curb and, and practically blew out the tires. <laughs> because, you know, it, it, we can't drive looking out the side window. Right. Right? And sometimes I think, as Christians, we try to drive looking out the side window. And, and, it, and really, what happens is we get in, in an accident. We're like the, the mayhem guy for Allstate. <laughs> No. We're an accident looking for a place to happen because we're focused on the miners and we don't understand that in order to in order to really drive we have to get the big picture. Right. So you know, we need to picture the com community where God's community has a founder and a perfecter called Jesus and other leaders of the faith that we're called to imitate. So I kind of was looking through the Bible and and I um I really was curious because I saw similarities here in, in, a, in a guy in the Bible in the, in the New Testament, and I never thought about it before. So I, I, I kind of explored it a little bit, and I came up, I want to call uh, this 
three Ananii. <laughs> I made a plural. I, don't know. I didn't know whether it was, you know, Ananias. But um, so I just want to talk a little bit about their view of community and their view of leadership in the church and, and kind of play off of that a little bit. And maybe we can learn something. Let's just pray. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share your word. And Lord, I just pray that your scripture and your, your, your holy uh, word will, will just penetrate our hearts, Lord. Help us to be that person, Lord, that values you and values your community of believers, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, you know, I, I, I looked at these three guys, and they, there's three of them that are prominent in the New Testament. I didn't even know, mainly in the book of Acts. But they all represent an attitude towards human authority and community that we can kind of see in, that's happening in, in people and in, in uh, the church. There's one guy who kind of uh, had a more or less a gangster attitude towards authority, towards, uh, you know, the way that... Um, he was in a position. There was another guy that had a pretty low respect for it. And there was another guy who had a balanced and godly view of it. So I just want to discuss that for a minute. Sometimes um, the names mean, mean something, and sometimes you can make too much of a name. But the name that that means, Ananias, is that it's a cloud of the Lord. And I just want to use that imagery to set up the stage because we have a great cloud of witnesses, whether we know it or not. Amen. It's not just the people that are in alive now, but there's a great cloud of witnesses that are watching what's going on. And, and I don't know what's, what happens up there, but if they can pray, I bet they were praying for us. I, I bet that I know Jesus is, but we don't really know, you know, what, what is happening with a great cloud of witnesses, it says in the book of Hebrews, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that's before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. The cloud of witnesses. The real cloud isn't the internet. <laughs> it's a great cloud watching us. God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. Amen. Right? Amen. He's purifying that bride. He's not collecting a harem. In a very real way, he's whipped, insulted, spit upon, humiliated, nailed to a tree, tortured, and died for the entirety of us, even with all our spots and wrinkles. Amen. So... Let me just take you to the first, first one. It's not in the order of their appearance, but I want to take you to the first um, one that I want to speak about, the first Ananias. <laughs> in Acts 23, 1-5. This is when Paul is, goes to Rome, and he says, at the, at the council, he says, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to, to be struck? Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So here's like a dude in the religious system, if you want to call him a dude. Um, he worked his way up the ladder, right? Probably. Or he knew someone to get there. And now he's kind of like the, the head guy, you know? The guy who can uh, tell everybody else what to do. And he's not going to let his position go because he earned it. Is there anyone like that that you know? Maybe in the world or even in the church? Someone who feels like some, their position is something to be earned instead of received. Think of I can think of people in both instances, you know, it, like somebody gets a, a uniform or a badge or authority, all of a sudden out comes Rambo. <laughs> you know, somehow like 
absolute authority corrupts absolutely once you get that uniform on and you know we used to we used to wear uniforms in in the in letter carriers and and somehow like the dogs knew that <laughs> And I figure if dogs knew that, people know it, you know? It's like anybody else could be walking by and, and the dog would, you know, just be laying down or something. But then all of a sudden, I'd walk by and all of a sudden, Rambo comes out of the dog. One time I was, uh, I said, oh, the dog's in the fence. He won't bother me, you know, he's within the fence. And, I, and the, the, the box was actually on the fence. And so I was kind of just not paying attention. I went like this. He, he jumped up and grabbed the mail and, and went like that all over the lawn. <laughs> he almost took my finger off. But it, it's kind of like, you know, some people, they think that because they've earned this thing, uh, you know, even if they've been in a job for 30 years or something like that, well, you should know just as much as I do about the job because, you know, um, I expect you to, uh, to kind of understand that 30 years that I just put in, it's kind of like a, that position or that, that thing that we gather up and earn in our worldly way really um, makes us kind of think other people are ignorant in a way. And I think we can kind of get that way in a church a little bit. Um, hopefully not as much, but you know, if somebody doesn't, is coming up and doesn't quite know um, what, the, what the story is in, as far as Christianity goes or as far as Jesus goes, you know, they, when the first century, they had um, they had people coming in from other places of worship that where they had temple prostitutes, they had all this uh, this other stuff going on. They didn't really know what God was saying. They they just got all of a sudden they got baptized, they got saved, and they were depending on people to to actually disciple them and show them what's right and what's wrong according to Scripture. Kind of have a discipleship group and. You know, that we really need that as well. We, we need that to be able to have someone um, say, okay, God has put me here. Now let me just show you the way that he's laid out for his disciples. And uh, this Ananias here, he despised Saul as well because Saul, if you remember, betrayed his profession. He was just as much, if not better, than this other guy. But he knew that Saul used to be that, and he kind of betrayed his profession, so now he's ready to slap him because he knows that he's not following God. He knows that he's gotten involved in this uh, rogue group called Christians that he used to persecute, but now all of a sudden he's following Christ, and, and that really rubbed him the wrong way. So he told those people, go and slap that guy. Slap his mouth. He forgot where he came from. You know, we don't have to become what, where we came from, but we can forget it and press on. That's right. We don't forget where we came from. We're sinners saved by grace, but we don't have to become where we came from. Amen. That's not good. We have to become what we are. We have to uh, take hold of the identity that Christ has given us, but we never forget where we came from. That's right. Jesus' church is not a hierarchy of infallible people. We all have blind spots, and if we think we don't, we're probably a blind leader of the blind. I, I just think of, uh, I always think of driving for some reason, because it always irks us, at least me. You know, if I was driving behind myself, I probably would yell at myself. <laughs> Because I have blind spots, you know. The guy is late and he's going, he cuts me off and, you know, I'm yelling at him, you know, don't you know the rules of the road? Don't you know where you're going? You idiot, you know what I mean? And, but, you know, if I really was honest, right, I've been late. <laughs> I've been late. I've gone like 75 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour to try to get to work, you know, and, and passed a guy on the right and, you know. And, uh, of course, that didn't bother me at all because I knew it was for a good, good reason. It's for me. <laughs> So, we all have those blind spots, and you know, you know, but notice how Paul answered. Even though this guy was all that stuff I just said, Paul answered, he, at first he answered to uh, rebuke him, 
But then he said, I did not know, brothers, that he was a high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. For it is written, How did he guide his life? Through what is written. And even though we know that we're not under a legalistic um, system, we still allow the Holy Spirit to speak through the Word of God in different situations in our life. And it should bring back to remembrance all those things that we put in there already. Amen. You know, if there's nothing in there, it's like a computer. If the program goes in and there's nothing there, nothing's going to come out. That's right. And so it's really essential, I think, if we're, we're going to get together, that we all get into the Word of God and really have it written in our hearts. So when we come to a situation like that, we can be like Paul and say, you know what? I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. He valued that authority, even though that authority was corrupt. Think of it. And, you know, that's kind of the, uh, the attitude that we need to have. Obviously, we don't follow an authority if they're going to lead us against Christ or against Scripture or something like that. But if there's a way that we can live at peace with all people, it's according to this. Amen. So, you know, it says in Psalm 75, 6-7, For not from the east or from the west, and not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. Do we really believe that? That the th way things are, are a part of a plan. That when we are submitting to whatever's um, in, in positions that he puts in his church, we're really submitting to him. Is he going to value that? Is he going to su um, support his word? In John 19, 10 to 11, Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. You know, I thought about that for a minute. And I said, who, who delivered Jesus over? Was he talking about Judas or Caiaphas? Because I think the high priest did that. But nevertheless, it kind of scared me a little bit because it seems like he's saying that... He, we are going to be judged by the measure we're given, not by the effectiveness of the measure that we used. Let me say that again. Seems like he was saying by that, therefore he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. In other words, he expected those people to have that knowledge. He expected Judas to be the apostle that he had set him out to be. He expected Pilate, or the, the Caiaphas, or whoever the high priest was, to, to be all that he gave him in that responsibility. So it, it scared me because I was thinking, you know, I wonder what kind of a thing we're going to be judged for, what kind of measure will actually judge us. And, you know, all of us hope, and I hope, that God is merciful and graceful in, in all that he does, and therefore he understands that, that we fail. He understands that we come to him in repentance. He understands that we're not going to be all that we could be. Yet, it still seems like he, he has greater responsibility and greater um, judgment on, on those that he's given more things. And so, I think, you know, it, it's something to think about. Amen. That's good. <clears throat> The second Ananias that I want to talk and is uh, the famous one. You remember Ananias, that had his wife Sapphira, in Acts 4? I want to just read, read the, it kind of in the context just to, just to get an idea of where they were in, in the book of Acts. So it's saying in Acts 4.32, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Sounds like a, a situation I'd like to be in. Great grace upon them all. They had to be unified. Right. They had to be unified. 
because they were one heart and soul. So it is possible. If it happened then, they weren't right. special people. Right. They were at the beginning, but they still weren't special people. They still were human beings. They weren't angels. They weren't some super-powered uh, hero. So <clears throat> it says, There was not a needy person among them. Amen. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any, as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means sons of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. There was a healthy respect for the leadership at that point. Um, you know, and, and we are not the apostles. <laughs> we didn't write the scriptures. But at the same time, there is an order that, that God sets out if we're going to be an army. We have to have that order. There's right. no way around it. That's right. We have to have it. <clears throat> and so Ananias and Sapphira come in, and the man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard it. A couple things about, about Ananias in this story. He really didn't recognize the importance of the community that had just been um, talked about in, in the previous verse. Somehow he wanted to separate himself from those who were giving their, their entire selves to God and laying all that they had down, all of their possessions. And he thought kind of that, um, you know, who's going to really know? I mean, maybe he made excuses for it and said, well, you know, I'm going to make sure I pay it back later or, you know, you know how we go through those things just, just, just for justification purposes. And, you know, sometimes they say, well, I would, you know, I wouldn't mind if somebody did that to me as long as they gave me, you know, portion of it or whatever. And so we go through those things and kind of, we kind of denigrate the, the, uh, the community that we're in because we really have a debt to our community. We have a debt to society. You know, when somebody goes to jail, it's like that they pay their debt to society, not just the person that they wronged, but they pay their debt to the society. And so, he also conspired with his wife. And that's important because Christ <laughs> loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so he might present the church to himself like a husband should love his wife. And really, that was not an act of love in conspiring to do that. It's kind of like Adam and Eve in the garden. That wasn't an act of love that, that they kind of conspired together, whichever uh, way you want to look at it. They both were at fault. You know, the, the Bible says that Eve was deceived, and, and, but Adam wasn't, so he took the responsibility. All through the Bible, it talks about, as an Adam, all die. You know, it pretty much puts it on his head. But... You know, he didn't recognize the importance of that community in his, in his relationship with his wife. That was broken. He broke faith with that, not only the community, but he broke faith with his wife, really. And I think that's what, why the judgment was so harsh, one of the reasons anyway, was because this is precious to God, and when everybody is, is operating in unity, and, and other husbands and wives are, are become one flesh and unite with that, when somebody comes in, it really is like it says, Satan filled your heart. 
And it was to lie to the Holy Spirit, not just man. Right. It was to lie to God. Because these people were representing the Holy Spirit in that situation. Just as Christ represents the church, the Holy Spirit represents the, uh, the effectiveness of the church or the, the, the place of the church within, within our, our community. So he lost the battle with Satan. That's what we don't want to do. Right. We're all facing it. And we don't want to lose that battle. You know, I, I pray all the time that I stand, I stand firm and I recognize the enemy and I, and I uh, resist the enemy and he, and he flees. And sometimes it's harder than others. But we don't want to get to that place where I don't know whether Ananias was, was, a, was a, a regenerated Christian, was born again, but it says Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. And he was a, in that community. So there is possible that we can be affected by what Satan does. We have, to, we have to stand firm and recognize that the battle is the Lord's, not his. And so he, he also didn't recognize the importance of leadership. Perhaps he didn't know that Peter was an, as important a figure as he is. You know, Jesus said, prophet is not without honor except in his own country. A lot of times we don't respect our leaders and people because we know them too well. Amen. Right? We've grown up with him maybe. You know, I've known him since he was a kid. You know, he's nobody special. And we, we kind of tend to think that we're, we're just because we know like Jesus when he was a carpenter, he can't become what he became. Because, oh, he's a carpenter's son. You know, I'm the letter carrier. This, you're this guy, you're that guy. You're, you know, you can you could name. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because he was declared by God as the apostle to the Jews and would have his words in Scripture, but Ananias didn't know that yet. Or he, he just ignored what God was doing through the leader, leaders of the, of the church at that time. He essentially stole from the leadership what God had required them to manage. So, let's go on to the last one, and this one I, I really believe is kind of a balanced picture of, um, of what community and what authority should be. And this is the guy that came to Saul after Jesus had knocked him off his horse. That's, they're found in Acts 9. He was, this is the, the last one I want to talk about. I kind of wrote down what they did in, in rhyme, like so I remember it, that <laughs> the, um, the uh, other Ananias, he lied and died. This Ananias obeyed and prayed. In Acts 9, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus called Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell off his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. I feel this is a healthy view of authority and community exhibited by this guy. It says, first of all, that there was a disciple 
at Damascus named Ananias. You know when it talked about the other guy, the other one, it said there's a man named Ananias. This guy was a disciple. Amen. So we knew how to be under authority of the church and the community. Paul said later about him that, and one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. So he was really someone who was well spoken of because he was devout and because he was living God's law. <laughs> Now we know he was a Christian because he was a disciple, but he was still uh, under authority and he, he lived so that he was really respected because of the way that he lived. And not only that, but he respected God and he put him above men's authority. Because for an obvious reason, he was directed by God to do this because I imagine there wasn't too many disciples at that time would have gone to Saul and believed. Think of it. Right. <laughs> right? I mean, if somebody told you to go to somebody that was, you know, persecuting the church, was killing people and, and doing all that stuff, oh yeah, sure, yeah, right, he's saved now, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy really respected God and he put him above men's authority. So, you know, Maybe no other disciple would have even gone. <laughs> Who knows? But Ananias heard the Lord. That was his word that he was speaking to him. And he, he brought it where it was supposed to go. He said, here I am, just like Isaiah, just like many people in the Bible said, here I am, Lord. Send me. He not only respected God and put him above men's authority, but he respected the community that God was trying to establish because he called Saul brother. I don't know if anybody ever noticed that. <clears throat> brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately scales fell off his eyes, he regained his sight, rose and baptized. Taking food, he was strengthened. I don't know if it came to your mind, but by that time, Saul's name hadn't been changed to Paul. Right. He wasn't healed. He wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit yet. He wasn't even baptized in water. And yet, Ananias came because of the word of the Lord that had been spoken to him, and he said, Brother Saul. Imagine the change from the first time when he said, But God, this guy here has killed people in your name. But the Lord said, go, and he went. How many people has the Lord said, go to here? Think of it. Am I? I hope all of us. Because he's already told us, go. And to me, that's a command that we do. And the only time we stop is when God tells us to stop. The Holy Spirit really, I think, works in a way that that is more of a, a guide to, to, to holding us back in, in different situations than, than to actually stop going. That's right. I think we have that, that charge to go. The commander says, go until I hear another order, I'm going to go. Amen. I'm going to do. I'm going to teach or I'm going to try to uh, you know, respond to the command that he, that he gave to go. And so, you know, he called Saul brother at that point. But he did something about it, and this is really the key. He ministered to the person according to the Word of God. That's right. That's right. He spoke words of encouragement to him. He, he spoke the word that God had spoken to him. He laid hands on him, saw him healed and filled with the Holy Spirit. He baptized him in water. He fed him. All of these examples of other Ananias either failed or didn't comprehend what God wanted to do. This, this one, he succeeded to dispense the word of God in, the, in his situation in life. So, we really want to display that kind of an attitude, I feel, that we are under authority, in human authority, but we also have a higher, higher authority who has already given us what we must do. He's already given us the outlines of our greater cause. The greater cause. And I think that the greater cause, if it's being done, a lot of things will come into, come into place. 
In other words, uh, he, this guy just did one thing at a time. He spoke God's word to him. He laid hands on him. He wasn't baptized yet, but he baptized him. He also fed him because he hadn't eaten in a long time. And so my message today is that we want to try to unite in a community that has a greater vision and a greater purpose. And sometimes it's going to be that we either leave something out in our, in our fellowships or we, we add something that we're not supposed to sometimes. We're human. You know, we, when we try to put the Bible into a context, there's always something that's either could be put in or could be left out, one or the other. I mean, think of it. If you were called to, to put something in a context, put the, the church of God into a context, how would you do it? Without creating some kind of a, an, either a, a stumbling block or something, if somebody was used to this some way, somebody was doing this and thought this was important and that was important and the other thing. But in order to, to really have an army, we have to put something into a context. And we have to unite around it. And hopefully, as other fellowships, and we're, we're, we're gathering together in, in the view of the last times, we're gathering together this, this um, vast community of believers, we can unite in God's mission and God's purpose without dividing like the enemy wants us to in all kinds of different pathways that, that people have. You know, it's, it's a... I used to sing a song called Denomination Blues. And uh, it said, <clears throat> It's right to stand together, it's wrong to stand apart, but none shall enter heaven but the pure in heart. Amen. And that's all. So we want to just strive for that pureness of heart that, that will also lead us to be one with not only Christ, but, but each other. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that you are in the business of uniting us around your word, around who you are. You are the word of God. As we grow closer, Lord, to the end and we see all these things happening, Lord, help us to unite without having extreme situations come upon us where we, we have crisis management, Lord. Help us not to do that. Help us to see the need and to come together, Lord, and to be able to serve you in oneness just as it was in the beginning. So we just praise you, Lord. We, we ask that you bless the remainder of our day. And... God, thank you for sending Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.